it working? Yes, it is. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I am here for another of our scheduled lives. Um, you voted in the uh, Whippet uh, Facebook group that you wanted me to talk about reactivity this week. So today I am talking reactive do uh, whippets, uh, do's and don'ts, uh, you know, what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing. There's so, so much, <laughs> so much misinformation out there. So as always, this will be recorded and shared afterwards. Um, and if you want to get in touch, you can. Um, you're always welcome to join in as well while I am watching, while I'm watching, while I'm talking. That would make more sense. Um, so you're always welcome to comment, like, and such. So today we are talking reactive dogs. We are talking reactive with it specifically, but a lot of this will be uh, general information for reactivity. So if you're watching this and you're wondering um, what is reactive, what is a reactive dog? What is reactivity? What is Zara going on about now? Um, a reactive dog is basically a bit of a label. We put on uh, a group of dogs who either bark or lunge or growl or snap or, you know, kind of behaviours we deem as problems um, around either other people, other dogs, or even cyclists, joggers, uh, wildlife and similar. So reactivity is, you know, a relatively... Uh, big umbrella of behaviours. You'll have some dogs who are reactive because they are frustrated. You'll have some dogs who are reactive because they are anxious. You'll have some dogs who are reactive because they're just a bit excited or they lack social skills. Or in my opinion, you'll get a lot of dogs that fall under the umbrella of having quite a few of those emotions. I don't believe just one emotion is at play with reactivity. I believe more often than not, there's a couple of emotions. I think it would be very overly simplistic to just assume that one is at play. So very often I will see uh, fear and uh, frustration in the same dog. They want to get over there because they want to investigate what's going on, right? So reactive dogs are dogs who bark, they lunge, they growl, they snap at various different triggers for various re uh, reasons, various different emotional responses. So you know, that's it. that can be applied to anybody, that's not just, that's not just with it. Um, but why are dogs reactive? So dogs are reactive, <laughs> it's, it's always very difficult to pinpoint with each individual dog. It's always going to be really hard to go, ah, that was the moment, this is why. Because there's often like a huge um, multitude of reasons as to why a dog might be reactive. One of the reasons could be that they have had a really bad experience with the thing that they are reactive to. So if they are reactive to dogs, it could be that when they were a puppy, they were pushed around at, let's say, like a puppy party, or they were just bowled over by dogs in the fields, um, or maybe they were even attacked. Um, and that could be a poor experience around other dogs that results in reactive behaviour. Um, poor experiences can be related to other things other than dogs. It could be your puppy had a, a bad experience um, with a car, with a certain noise while they were young. I'm keeping an eye on my puppy. He was, be, he was being quite happy chewing and suddenly, oh, he's moving the chew across the floor, that's fine. Um, I just wondered what he'd found. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be other dogs and it, uh, it, the, the dog decides what the negative experience was. So, you know, it might have been no big deal to us as humans, but to our dogs, it might have been something dreadful. So it could be poor experiences. It could be um, genetics. Some, some dogs are just a little like their parents. If their parents were anxious or their parents were reactive, they are far more likely to be reactive. Um, it, it's really common to see that in certain lines of, of dogs of different breeds. Um, you know, you often hear about like cocker rage um, in like certain lines of cockers. There's certain lines of certain breeds where genetics play a huge part. You know, genetics make a big difference. So if the parents were anxious, the parents were reactive, that could be Hi, Uncle. One reason why your dog is reactive. Um, what else could it be? It could be, um, and this one's never, uh, you know, to make it all feel bad, but it could be that they have experienced like a negative association with their trigger, whether it's dogs, people, cyclists. Maybe we've got cross with them, around them. Maybe we've shouted at them. Uh, maybe we've used uh, like collars and things they don't enjoy. Maybe they have a bad association as a result of something that has happened. 
So we've got why dogs might be reactive so far. They're just like a brief overview. Um, I will say a lot of dogs are likely to become reactive during adolescence um, is one thing I missed there. A lot of dogs are likely to be quite a relatively happy sociable puppy and then as they hit about six to nine months hello again Arkle um, then they can tend to develop these reactive issues as they're hitting this uh, second fear period they're hitting adolescence things they may not have had good experiences with or things that they have had uh, you know really bad experiences with are far more likely to impact them so this is often the time that you notice your whippet's behaviour change, between about 6 to 18 months usually. It's almost bang on 9 months for most of the dogs I work in with, um, but it, do, it does vary quite hugely under that umbrella. So, reactivity do's and don'ts. I've got a list, and if you have any questions, ask away. If you want to join in with emojis, I've learned that word, finally, you can. Um, so, what I'm going to start with is what not to do, because it's easier to start with that and then give you loads of suggestions of what you can do. What I will say is um, everything is individual, every dog is slightly different, so it's never going to be like a simple straightforward roadmap, as it were. Um, so, what do we not want to be doing if we have a reactive dog? What we don't want to be doing is um, what you might often see on TV or you might have uh, people suggest to you, which is that when your dog barks or your dog lunges or your dog growls or your dog snaps, that you tell them off, whether that is verbally or physically. So that might be that you shout at them, I can't shout, there's a puppy here, no, or you shout, you know, stop or leave it or you pull on the lead or you spray water in their face or you use like um. Uh, you know, something that is, is what the dog would deem aversive, something they would happily avoid. Um, if you do these things when your dog is reactive and they react, you there are two things that might happen. There are probably more, but <laughs> I'm probably not going to think of them as I go. Uh, there are a couple of things that are likely to happen. If we use aversives and something is happening, there is a chance that we might be able to stop the behaviour happening. But the fallout of that is much higher. Um, there, is far more, there is far more likelihood of this going really wrong and that is that if we shout at them or we use an aversive or you know whether it's like I say I'll pull on the lead or a shout even if it's just from our stress I'm not saying everyone's doing it on purpose <laughs> reactive dogs are stressful um, but what's likely to happen is we are going to create a greater response a greater level of reactivity towards that because what your dog starts to learn is that when, let's say it's dogs, just for the sake of like this conversation, if my dog reacts to a dog and I say no and I pull on the lead, my dog learns that when they see a dog and they say they're uncomfortable by barking, they get more punishment. It becomes a really negative association. That dog now means that he gets told off by his owner. Let's say it's Arkle. Arkle now thinks that when he gets uh, sees a dog and he barks at them, uh, he's going to get told off by me. And that, that makes other dogs even more scary, it makes them even more something he would maybe want to react to, and it would also damage his relationship with me. Because when your dog is barking and lunging, they're giving you information. I say it a lot, behaviour is information. Um, they're saying I can't cope, I don't know how to handle this, I would like this situation to, to change. And if your dog is barking and lunging, and you say stop it, da -da -da -da, whatever words we're using, um, what our dogs learn is that, you know, bad things happen. We are not, we are unpredictable as humans as well. We get, re we get mardy with them when they tell the, when they tell us how they feel, right? So if I'm punishing my dog for telling me how my, they feel, what else might happen from that? There's a lot of negative fallout in that we could potentially, I don't recommend it, it's a don't, we could potentially tell our dogs off um, when they're reacting and they might stop. And they might stop for a few weeks. Let's let's say you've gone to that kind of trainer. I'm sure everyone knows the kind of trainer I may be talking about, like an old-fashioned trainer who's gonna be a bit pushy with your dog. They've gone there for a few weeks, and you know, as an owner, you're like, oh my gosh, my dog has stopped barking, my dog has stopped lunging. They're fine with dogs now. But actually, all that's happened is your dog has stopped barking and lunging. We haven't addressed why your dog was barking and lunging. So that emotion is still simmering under the surface. We have just punished our dog telling us they don't like it. So what happens with a lot of these dogs, and I work with a lot of dogs like them in like, you know, in person, um, because there are a lot of trainers like that uh, locally, um, what happens is that dog, um, it's simmering under the surface. They're still looking at that dog thinking, I don't like you. But the only thing that I've learned is that when I bark and lunge, 
I, I, I get in trouble. I get a negative association. So that's still under there. So there's a really high potential that when that dog actually gets close up, that one day, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next week, but one day that dog is gonna lose its um, control um, and it's gonna say how it really feels and probably snap at the other dog. Maybe even more serious because that's been pent up under the surface, so whip it on my foot, um, for quite some time. So punishing a dog might seem like it might work on the face of it in that you stop it instantly like in that moment and it might feel like that you're stopping it maybe even like on the face of it your dog stopped barking for like a temporary period of time but that's still under there they're still anxious and what might happen is they stop start reacting to other things and they start showing other problem behaviors because they're still you're just gonna drag it all out uncle they're still reactive they're still anxious we've basically just taken like the um the batteries out of our smoke alarm <laughs> we're now saying don't warn us you don't like that dog by barking or growling and lunging we're just gonna wait and find out. We're just gonna wait and see what happens, which is a lot, lot more difficult to deal with. So we don't wanna be using aversives. Uh, we don't wanna be using things that our dogs are likely to want to avoid, such as uh, prong collars, choke chains, um, prong collars, choke chains, shock collars, spray collars, um, rattle cans, um, shouting, lead corrections, because these don't address, they don't address the issue here. They don't address what's really going on. They just provide like a temporary, um, a temporary thing. It, it stops them in the moment, but it's not addressing anything. And as someone who has learned this the hard way, it does make things much, much harder in the long run. Um, it does make your dogs a lot more likely to re react with, um, like, uh, I'm using my words, aren't I, this evening? With like volatility to situations because that's kind of how they they are treated, right? Um, so you know, I do have I do have a reactive whippet. Um, he used to be very reactive to everything, um, and we did things the old-fashioned way to start with, and we realised really quickly that isn't the right way to do things. Um, it made Marley much worse. Marley's the one above me. Um, it made Marley much worse. He was much more reactive to dogs in the long run. And he started to redirect his aggression towards us as well, which had never previously been a problem. He started to realize that we were not pleasant to him when these things happened. And therefore he would, he would have some aggression at us. Maybe not, maybe not redirected in the exact moment, but like in his waking life, he did not trust us. So when it came to simple things like, oh, you finished with that chew, Molly, I'll have it back. We got a bit of a bite from Molly because he said, I don't trust you. You're not people I can trust. I don't feel safe with you. So I'm going to have to start taking things into my own hands. Okay, lay on that arkle. Um, so, we, you know, I'm not just saying this from like, you know, a uh, perspective of you should never do this. I also know it from the perspective of I've done this and I, I know the, the, the consequences of it. And it takes years to undo that kind of thing. So what else should you not do? You should not flood your dog. So what is flooding? Um, flooding is basically putting your dog in a situation and making them cope with it. Flooding is basically having your dog in a group of other dogs. That's bothering me clearly. In a group of other dogs um, and... Um, making them deal with it. So some group classes might do that. They might say to you, give me your dog. I'm gonna pull on his lead. I might correct him. Please don't eat that uncle. Um, and um, then what's gonna happen is we're just gonna stay in this group for 30 minutes to an hour, or we are gonna walk with this group of dogs. And what you might find is that your dog looks, again, okay, they're not reacting. They're not barking. They're not lunging. So you might feel like, you know, pro problem solved. But what's really going on is, is what we call flooding and learned helplessness. Your dog has learned they're in a situation that they can't get out of and that the best option is to keep their head down. There are loads of situations like in life with, as humans that we might do that in um, where we'd say, oh, I don't want any trouble. I'm not going to, there's no way out of this. I'm just going to put my head down. And again, we're not addressing why they're responding like that. And again, they're very likely to have more intense uh, reactions and, and aggression out of, nowhere because they're not going to be barking they're not going to be lunging but one day <laughs> they're probably going to snap at and maybe go further as as another again i'm saying dog it could be people it could be loads of different things uh, it comes close so flooding is dangerous it has bad side effects it's not it's not ideal in any sort of context what else should we not do i promise we're getting on to the stuff we can do in a minute i promise um <laughs> i don't like being bossy about telling you all not what not to do um 
What else should we not do? We should not take our dogs on the same walk every day where we know they're going to see their trigger and react. Um, if we take them out every day and you know, you know that walk has hundreds of, again, dogs or people or cyclists or children or, you know, whatever it is your dog finds suspicious. It could be anything. Um, if you keep taking them out on those walks where you know those things are and you know your dog can't cope, practice makes perfect. They're going to get better at reacting to those things because it becomes more of a, like a, a classically conditioned response. I see a dog, again I'm using dogs, I bark. I see human, I bark. And if that keeps, please don't eat that, if that keeps happening um, every day, they're just going to keep doing it. Not only are they going to keep doing it, but they're in a chronic state of stress. If they're reacting to things every day, their body, their stress levels are up here, and it actually takes about 72 hours for a dog's stress levels to flush after a bad experience, up to 72 hours usually. Um, and what that means is they're full of adrenaline, they're full of cortisol, um, like throughout the day after a bad experience, which means they're gonna be more likely to, to react to something. So we really don't wanna be constantly putting in them in these situations where they can't handle it, because that's just, nothing will ever get resolved, nothing at all. So what do we want to do? we want to do there are loads of things that we can do to help a reactive dog um i i as i said i have marley who used to be reactive to people dogs cyclists children joggers um wheelie bins like if they weren't there the day before i'm sure some of you have had that your dog sees something novel just changes in his environment pretty much they were they were pretty um they were pretty scary um he used to be reactive to everything it was really hard to walk in. Um, if he saw something three fields away, he would react. Whereas now, you know, I can walk him down the street, we can see a dog across the road, and I would say 90% of the time, he doesn't react. Sometimes, if it's a German Shepherd or a Labrador, he does not like them. No offense, <laughs> no offense to everyone. Just has had that many bad experiences, he does not like them. But even then, he's, he's very manageable. I can walk him past people now, happily, he can engage with new people. I mean, he still looks to me, um, because of the training that I'm about to talk to you, when he sees a cyclist, they used to be his least favourite things. Um, now he just sees a cyclist and looks to me and goes, come on, get on with it, where's my food? <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know the game better than me sometimes. He's got better at telling me when to feed him than anything. Um, so we had my, I had a reactive Jack Russell as well. Um, a Womble was a different kettle of fish. He was, he was, um, you know, he would... He would take things a good step with other dogs, unfortunately, being a terrier. And then I had Arthur, um, who was a young whippet. Um, he would get very um, stalky, like a, like a collie. He would like stalk dogs and then lay down. And as you got older, that kind of progressed into being very um, uh, like uh, confrontational is the word I'm looking for. He could be a bit like, you want a piece of me? To random dogs and they'd be terrified um if you're wondering what i'm doing puppy's laying on his bed and every now and then i'm just throwing food so he stays there um i should explain these things shouldn't i um so what could do it what can we do what do we want to do what are the things that you should be doing okay so i've got a list if you have any questions as well do i don't know where the comment thing is on your thing comment um you're welcome to questions anything so what do we want to do just to start with we want to do management we want to try and avoid putting our dogs in situations they can't handle just for a little while so that might mean walking your dog at a different time to avoid the trigger it might mean going out in the car to somewhere quiet uh, check out my post on um freedom walks um, if you want some ideas on that um it should be in the whippet group under the lives post um but we want to be just avoiding them uh, avoiding triggers temporarily. It's not a long-term solution. You might have been to a trainer and they've said just avoid stuff and that's a good short-term management tool but we need to then do the other stuff with it. We've got loads of stuff we need to do with that. And the reason that we're doing that is so they don't rehearse the wrong behaviours <coughs> and that they are not stressed day to day. And it's always about looking at the long game with reactive dogs. Nothing is going to be achieved within a week. Sorry, nothing's gonna be achieved within two weeks, in all likelihood. We're looking at a long game. It pays off, this dog. It took me probably about six to 12 months and he'd had a horrible history. Um, and he's, he's pretty much pretty much all right um, at the minute. So we, I know management's frustrating. I know it drives everyone insane, but if you don't do the management, you might as well not do the rest of it. Because it's the same as saying, I'm going on a diet, but I'm also gonna have cake every day. 
mainly as a meal. You can't do both. <laughs> you can't say I'm trying to stop you barking at dogs, but here's a load of dogs to bark at, if that makes sense to everyone. Um, so we want to manage just short term, just temporarily, where at the distance our dog can't cope. I think that's a really important part. They can see stuff at the distance they can cope because the next part is find that distance where your dog can cope. There will be a distance. It might feel like it, it might not feel like it, but whether that is um, two fields away, three fields away like with Marley, um, whether it's just across the road or a wider road, there will be a distance your dog can cope with the stuff that they're worried about or reactive about. And that is the distance we want to work at. That is the distance where we want to be saying, that thing, food, 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 food. That thing equals good things. That thing equals, your puppy. That thing equals good associations. So when you see that thing, while we're in the threshold is what we call it, at the distance we can cope, I'm gonna feed you, I'm gonna reward you. You're making good choices, we're creating a positive association. That is what we want to do. There will be a distance where your dog can cope with their triggers. And that is the distance we have to work at. We cannot work when your dog is over threshold, which is barking, lunging, growling. For some of your dogs, it might be as simple as they usually can take food, but they can't anymore in the presence of their trigger. That is over threshold. We want to work under that because that is a point with which our dogs can learn. Our dogs can't learn when they're in high emotional states, when they're in fight or flight. So there will be a distance, I promise, whether it's miles away, um, but there will be a distance they can work. And that is a distance we want to work at. And that is a distance where we are going to take out our bestest treats in the whole world, like the best. You don't want to be stingy when we're doing behavior modification. And again, this is a really rough guide and it, it, your individual dogs will vary. Um, so this is just a really vague like do's and don'ts, but that, this is the vaguest, vaguest form. Here's his dog. This is a distance you can cope big chunk of chicken, big, you know, half a cocktail sausage, have all the best associations, don't need to be there long, two minutes, super, let's go, let's leave, before anything bad happens. Big mistake people often make is they try and make it a long, prolonged exposure. It does not need to be. Short, sweet, big, positive associations will go much further than prolonged exposures where things might go wrong. Uh, I know this, I, I walked Molly a lot. Um, I definitely am the kind of person who naturally tries to push things. I'm like, oh, just a few more minutes watching that German Shepherd across the field. Ah, we pushed it too far. The German Shepherd would now like to run at us. That has now ended in disaster. We don't want that. We're gonna take short, quick associations, uh, powerful associations and leave. Whether that's taking you out in the car, sitting with you in the boot of the car, watching dogs across the car park. Uh, again, I keep using dogs, it could be people, it could be anything you like. Um, it could literally be whatever you fancy. Um, maybe the bear is not going to do what I want. Um, it just nags at me. Um, so, behaviour modification is like the key thing that we're going to do, but we have to do it at a distance our dog can cope. And to start with, you're going to think, how, how am I meant to do this? <laughs> this is insane. Once you get into the rhythm of it, it, it doesn't need to be every day. That's one thing I'll say, it doesn't need to be every day. Um, it can be once a week. If you're doing your other walks as management walks, doesn't matter, once a week, twice a week. It depends on your schedule, it depends on what your dog can handle, it depends on, oh please don't eat that. Why do I have, why are puppies so fun? One moment, please don't eat that. I'd rather you didn't eat that. Well, it survived, it survived. It's my little wristy watch step counter, pedometer I think. Um, I'd rather he didn't eat it, just a preference. Um, so that's, you know, we want to work them at that distance and it might be tricky um, and we might have moments where we're thinking, how am I meant to do this? It doesn't, it doesn't need to be every day. It doesn't need to be hard work as such. You know, I think that's the biggest problem we have um, or we can see with reactivity is we see it as, it must be every day, we must go and do this, we must go and do that. There are no rules. <laughs> as long as you're doing, as long as you're doing things vaguely right, go at the pace you and your dog want to go. If you don't want to rush things, don't rush things. If you want to do things at a good pace, you can do things at a good pace. But you can only ever go at your dog's pace. That's the other thing. So we want to create positive associations. Why do we want to do this? Well, what happens eventually is your dog will uh, stop learning to bark at things because we're not allowing them to rehearse that. Practice makes perfect. If a behavior isn't being done, it gets weaker. So they stop barking at things and they're getting a new association of food from human. What happens is, a bit like I said earlier, when, when they get good at this, they're going to start to see a trigger, and over time, I'm not talking weeks, maybe months, maybe even a 
little bit longer. Um, depending on your dog, um, depending on your time, your dog is going to notice their trigger and look to you. They're going to look to you because they're going, where's the chicken one? Or the, you know, whatever you use. <laughs> Where is it? I'd like it, please. Because they know that thing predicts food from us. So I no longer have to reward Marley just for noticing things. I can just wait for him to check in with me on a lot of his triggers. So yeah, like I say, cyclists were a big, big problem for him. Because where we live, and I, I can say this because I cycle as well, but where we live, a lot of people are very frustrating. And they spent a lot of time cycling up Marley's backside as a puppy on, on the path. Um, didn't like it, funnily enough. Hey, who knew? <laughs> who knew dogs wouldn't like that? Um, and it became a really big problem because people near me seem to cycle everywhere on the path. Um, these days, there's just a cyclist. I mean, literally earlier, he looked at a cyclist and went, like, glaring at me. Where is my food? And I waited to best and he got his food. Do I still pay him? Probably. He's nearly 11. He's slightly blind in one eye. Um, but I don't want him to have stressful walks. So it's just really easy to take one of my treats. I have treats with me a lot. And give it to him. So... We'll have what to do, we can manage, we want to manage, that's a key component. Component. We want to do behaviour modification, which is setting them up at the distance they can cope. Um, and this is like the two main things that most, most places are going to tell you. But there's a couple of other things I think you should do, personally. And I think we need to look at a lot of different aspects of your dog and why they're reactive. Um, we want to look at what, what might be causing them, you know, maybe it's bad experiences, you know, but what... Why are they so reactive to these situations? Are they chronically stressed? Are they having a stressful day to day on their walks? That's not so good, that's not gonna help. Are they pessimistic? Do they fear the worst in loads of situations? Do they lack confidence? A, a, a dog who lacks confidence is gonna be more reactive because they're seeing that you know person minding their own business and thinking that person's gonna, gonna get me. That person's gonna get me. And you tend to find that dogs not always, again, but generally, who are reactive, um, they tend to be a bit pessimistic and they tend to be a bit anxious. So we also want to do confidence building. We want to do loads of confidence building. Confidence building is relatively straightforward once we get the hang of it. Um, I've got a lot of lot of uh, cases at the minute um, with Wagging Wonders, my in-person business, where I'm working with anxious or reactive puppies who just need some confidence building and we're doing lots of games such as finding treats out of different objects uh, one of the puppies i'm working with at the minute they've just um he's gone from being quite scared at the sight of these boxes to putting his front feet in the boxes and now putting his whole body in the boxes which is amazing because he's really cautious about things like that as a reactive dog he's quite pessimistic um and all we've done is had some food in it had food around it and he's had the choice to do it. Low pressure. Low pressure is so important. I'm going off on a tangent there for sight hounds. We don't want them to feel pressured. I don't know about you, but a lot of my sight hounds do not do well with pressure training, like do this, do that, this is how it's gonna go, you must do it, otherwise we're not we're not doing anything else. I like them to think it's their idea. <laughs> I like them to think it's their um their training and that they have a good level of control because it makes them feel more confident. So I've got a confidence boost with um, my games called Serving Up Optimism, which I will pop in the group. Really simple, do it for meals. It's really straightforward once they get the hang of it. Um, we want to also think about maybe does that dog struggle with um, like disengagement? Do they struggle to come away from things? Do they struggle to let things go? Is the phrase I'm looking at. Um, Arthur, my last dog, um, he was really bad at letting things go, basically. He, uh, an experience would sort of be in his head for quite some time. Um, if it, were, it could be that I've left the house, he had separation issues. It could be that there was another dog, he wants to fixate and stare at them. And, you know, a dog who struggles with disengagement is going to struggle um, with reactivity because they're going to be like, fixed to it. We want them to be like, it's no big deal. So we're going to work on disengagement as a concept. We're going to work on them learning, you know, self-control maybe with food, uh, disengaging from situations with training games. There's loads and loads of ways that we can address this with key concepts too. It doesn't, I, I wouldn't just do the management and behaviour mod. Uh, you know, all of my in-person customers know this. I, I set them loads of homework on training games, of optimism boosting, on building a stronger relationship. There's loads of things we want to be doing. Our dogs tend not to be like robots. Our dogs tend not to be like 
um, they have a rule book or something where they're like, oh, you have done it correctly, we must just do it this way now, it's gonna work. Every dog is different, every dog's gonna have different struggles and they need like these training games to help them. Um, and I find that, you know, since introducing that kind of thing, it definitely helps my dogs much, much more and, and my clients' dogs more to the point. Um, God, puppy is so, being so calm here. It's, it's such a contrast. When Arthur was this age, he was very vocal. I have not heard Arkle bark yet. He's six months old. I might, those watching, if you have had a puppy, I might, is that weird? I feel like he should, he should have barked or vocalized or talked to me by now. I'm finding it weird. My whippets talk to me. Arkle doesn't talk to me, but that's a different tangent. Comment if this is weird. It feels weird to me. Uh, so, so yeah, so they're the main things we want to do. We want to do management, we want to do behavior mild, we want to address key concepts, and we don't want to make it like drills or high pressure. We want to keep it nice and low pressure. Like I said, the short, sweet experiences. So, I've talked about a lot. I've talked about a lot. And I've talked for a while. And I've only moderately, moderately been, it is very weird. <laughs> Good. I've, I'm really getting like, what it, I'm even trying to like wind the puppy up like, Will, will you bark if I wind you up like this? If I run around or if I... No. It's really odd. <laughs> I don't know many whippets. Maybe again, I'm weird. I don't know many whippets that don't vocalise by six months. Um, having said that, I'm probably going to live to regret that in the next month or so. And then he's going to never stop talking. And you might watch one of these in a month and be like, you kind of asked for it, Zara. Um, which is just the way my life goes. So I probably shouldn't say these things. Um, so, talked about a lot of different things. We have talked about um, why, our, why our whippets might be reactive. It might be due to previous experiences. It might be due to genetics. It might be due to um, like aversive experiences through training. We've talked about what not to do. He will make up for it. Yeah, I have a feeling I've, I've made a rod for my own back there. I have a feeling he's listening and going, okay. You want me to talk? I'll talk. I really shouldn't have said the. I say these things and literally, usually it's days, I regret them, days later. Um, <laughs> I'll record it in the first time he makes a noise. Um, what do we not want to do? We don't want to use aversives. We don't want to flood them. We don't want to keep putting them in the situations that they can't handle. We don't want to allow them to rehearse the, the problematic behaviors. Do we want to do, in summary, we want to manage them, we want to set them up for success, we want to do behaviour modification, which is creating nice, good associations with their triggers, and we want to address key concepts like um, optimism, engagement, disengagement, focus, all sorts of things. So, that's a really quick guide. Quick 30 minutes. Quickish. Um, does anyone have any questions at all? Um, I don't think I need to do any demoing with a puppy unless anyone suggests anything relating to it. Um, so I'll just sort of loiter around, see if anyone has any questions. Um, I will say that I am, hopefully, I've got a lot of projects on the go, setting up my, uh, I mean I am, I'm just, I don't know when. Uh, I am setting up my online um, classes for reactive dogs, which will cover in more detail, what to do, I'll have lots of videos, uh, lots of sheets, they're always my favourite, making videos and sheets, um, as well as sort of training those key concept behaviours too, they're going to be set up within the next month, uh, that's my deadline for me, um, so we could, and the joy of, the joy, the only joy, hey, potentially is the last year, there's loads we can do online, we've all discovered that, um, so if you need any help, um, we can do that, or I do offer one-to-one -one online sessions too, um, which can be very helpful. Um, super, so I can't see any uh, questions. Um, I hope that's all been helpful for those of you who could watch. Um, I am doing another of these, doing another of these tomorrow on the Waggy Wonders page. I'm doing what to do when your dog has a like fear response. So when they panic or they show like a startle response, what should you do? Um, that's gonna be at Waggy Wonders at 6 p.m. tomorrow. Yes, yeah, 6 p.m. Um, and then on Thursday, I'm getting in a few of these this week. I'm doing another on this page and it is um, adding another whippet to the household, you know, multi whippet household life um which i am very used to as i have marley he's not marley's not in the room with me he's got he's in a world of his own he's nearly 11 i've got marley the 11 year old ollie the nearly 13 year old i have arkel six months old and i also had um the uh, my previous whippet which we lost uh, very very recently um so we're used to multi multi whippet households they're fun jane says i've been trying to get my boy not to bark at people but he thinks if he barks he gets a treat is he, is he reactive to people? Is, is he excited, sorry? Or is he anxious? 
if he barks he gets a treat it might just be that you need to be even a little further away um depending on the situation um yeah, um, so it might be they just need to be a little further. I will, I will try, as I should have plenty in the group and post some more uh, videos. Because um, I do have loads of videos. The problem that I've had over the last five years is I didn't ever think they would um, come in handy. So they're just sort of like dotted around my Facebook page, um, my Instagram, and I'm now trying to like pull them up and the, the files get damaged. Ugh, it's driving me crazy. Um, so I end up refilming a lot, but I should have a lot. Um, any tips on how to disengage? Stitch will just stop and stare and not move at all. Oh, okay. Um, so that just might mean you're just sort of on the edge of his threshold. You might need to be even further away. Um, I think if my dog is trapped in that frame of mind, I'm going to do one of two things because this is what Arthur was like. If Arthur saw a dog, he would just stare and freeze. Sometimes he would tremble as well. You could have wafted a steak in front of his face. He was like, nope, busy at the minute. Thanks, mum, but you're all right. I've got things to do. I probably want to, uh, depending on how exactly they're staring, whether they're pulling into the lead, um, whether they're doing all sorts of other bits, I would want to, if I'm using a long line, use my movement away from them, almost into their eye line. So if I've got a dog in front of me, where you are, um, I would almost be walking, I'm going to do it, hang on, I do these things, so I don't think they ever look very helpful. Um, so I would almost be, you, you are dog, I'm going to walk behind, and just keep walking because my movement at some point is going to catch hang on, your eye and then I'm going to mark and reward you um, for you, the dog, um, for noticing um, and I might use uh, like a, throw, a thrown treat um, because that gets some moving again. I tend to find dogs um, who struggle to disengage tend to uh, be better with movement as a reward than, than food in position. We're often told that food in position is the best thing to do and it absolutely can be, but I definitely found with Arthur that the best option was food that, that moved as a reward because it almost redirected like his over arousal into, oh, I'm gonna chase the treat afterwards. So I would either walk around them to get them to disengage um, or I would try, if they're on a long line, um, walking up the lead. Have I talked about walking up the lead? Probably not. Um, it's literally just moving forward, getting a little more of the line, and not creating tension, I'm just, it might even be a, a slight T-touch principle, stolen -y. they're all like merged together, a load of these things, like the, the slack in the lead that's created by walking up it, tends to get them to like look look back to you. Um, I will, I will do, um, so Susanna, another thing you could do, uh, because I know you've done some of the trading uh, in that online class, so we did a little bit of the work. So we've done some work with uh, food in hand and self-control. I would see if, um, as a concept, Stitch could have some treats under, I'm looking for objects, you can see me getting very excited. Um, you can see when my brain works, I'm just like a whippet. Um, I would have food under an object, I'm using a dish at the minute. Um, I would show you with Arco, but I don't think he's ready for this yet. We've not, we're doing confidence building more than anything. Food under an object, can you do the self-control in the same way as food doing the control in your hand? Few reps of that, then can we do food under an object? Can you do behaviors for me? Can you look back to me, like naturally? Can I mark and reward that? Uh, can I ask you to sit, middle, down, spin? One of the various tricks. And then I'm gonna, it was an empty dish circle. Then I'm gonna reward you with the food that was under there. So you're learning, there is something that you're fixated on. Um, and it's even more exciting because we've put in a physical barrier. Often when we, that replicates real life more, um, there's something I see, there's something I want, I can't physically access it. Self-control pays and then not just self-control but re-engaging and doing an activity pays even more. If that makes sense, if that's helpful, Susanna. Um, I'm not sure if I'm just wittering on. <laughs> um, let me know if that's in any way helpful. Um, but yeah, that would be it. I would try, I would try and do games where we're working on disengagement like with the Plant Pot Prison game there that I just mentioned. Well crap pop prison style um for those who know what i'm talking about it's not exactly the same um and um use movement um to to try and catch their eyes but um i and i think that's you know when life happens sometimes life happens we can try and like uh, avoid situations and stuff um and sometimes a dog will pop up or a person will pop up or you know the most random things tend to pop up on my walks i remember arthur we were walking him somewhere and he suddenly like froze and stared and i was like what is he staring at and for some reason in this 
high in this area, um, there were a load of like um, wooden, like uh, reindeer, like you know the kind that you have around Christmas time that you put on your front door, maybe or in your garden, and they were like in a cuddle, and he was like. And just glared at it for ages. And it took me ages to register that that's what he was glaring at. And so sometimes it can be something absolutely random and you can't predict it. That's how I would maybe handle it in the moment. I don't tend to, where possible, I don't tend to say their name or try and get their attention too much because it's an information gathering exercise that they're doing. And the figure eight is staring is, what is gonna happen? What is gonna happen if I stare at you? What's gonna happen next? And sometimes it's better to interrupt, but in general, if you have the, the ability and the time letting them sort of process it themselves, they're going to come back quicker next time. Um, and, and I give, when I do that with Arthur, he'd get like a massive treat. Um, I think I've said before, I carry my normal training treats and then I carry my absolutely ridiculously huge, oh, we've done something amazing <laughs> training treats. You get them for naturally disengaging from things that he was fixated on. Which when he was a puppy was like crows and he really liked crows. Um, it was crows before dogs. So I'm not sure what happened. Um, anyway, anyway, I'm wittering on, I think, now. I don't think I'm helping anyone. I'm, I think my puppy's, like, plotting in the background. Hi, plotting. Yeah, says I'm always plotting. But silently plotting, not talking about it. I see Arthur couldn't do that. Anyway, I'm wittering, I'm wittering quite a lot, so I'm going to let you all go. If you have any questions, let me know. As I say, I am... I'm sorting those uh, classes, um, workshops, and all sorts of bits and bobs um, because I do love, I love reactive dogs. Like in wake, in waking life, in real life, in person. That's what I'm going for. In person, I mainly work with reactivity cases. Um, and if you follow the Wagging Wonders page, I should be putting up a video of a couple of my classes um, at the weekend. Um, and uh, they're very relaxed classes. <laughs> you would expect reactive dog classes to not be. They're very relaxed. Um, my customers get good results, um, even if I say so myself. Um, anyway, I'm gonna let you all go. Enjoy the rest of your evenings. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know in the group. I will pop up a, I'll pop up a sheet on reactivity, which I have, which is just probably a broad um, like recap of what we've talked about. Um, and I will pop in um, when I remember a couple of those games that I just mentioned as well, um, and probably whatever else I remember to, <laughs> that I said I would do. I promise I'll do it. Um, my puppy says he needs a wee, I think, so I think I'm going to have to go. Thank you for joining. Thank you for commenting. Any questions, any input, let me know. Um, otherwise, I'm going to let you all go. Bye, everyone. Thank you for joining.